Okay, go ahead. All right. By the way, uh, on this note, oh man, I'm getting some feedback. Are one of you using like a speaker? Oh, that got better. Thank you. Um, I, I, last night I did almost seriously submit a uh, two byte array Jira ticket to just rename it to two protobuf so that people, because I know it's bitten a lot of developers. And so um, I think it'd be really nice to just clean up the language so it's really clear what it's doing exactly. But okay, go on. Yeah. I guess I was so happy to have a universal serialization that I, that I the name to sort of, if it were <laughs> called serialized, that would make me happy. It's called encode. Oh my yeah, if it were just called, you know, at any rate, go on. Okay. Uh, so now we have our bytes, we hash them and sign them, and then that's the log. So this is, we're signing with that key, those bytes, and so we get that signature um, and return that. Uh, and so, yeah, get making sure that the, the, uh, the secured argument bytes are the same on both sides of you know the JavaScript side and the Rolang side was all the that's the whole trick. Um, so where were we? We computed the signature at some point, right? So we got the signature there. Um, and then we're going to use the send via thing, ugh, which looked kind of nice when I was working on it, but now it's hard to explain. Um, I'll look at the row line code that it's, it's running first and then maybe it'll make sense why it has to be that way. Okay. So here's the contract that I'm calling and um, you pass in a URI of basically Alice's um, wallet. Um, you say how much you're going to send uh, the nonce um, signature as a string, not as bytes. <laughs> um, and the pay, the public key of the payee, and a um, sort of a uh, unforgeable name that you're going to use for the person to send via, and then. Um, the return channel is just part of the, mechan the mechanism. Uh, and so we're going to look up in the registry, the wallet URI. And so now we've got the wallet and we do some tracing on the rolling side. Um, and then we go and make a wallet for Bob, the payee. And that's another contract inside this file. Um, and then once we have our hands on the wallet, then we use the standard basic wallet transfer method, mount, nonce, sig, and then this is the via purse, which is going to basically re be returned. These two here are return channels. Um, um, okay, so that's one thing that just, and, and I think it's because I'm not totally following everything, but one thing that immediately strikes me as strange is that the purse you created has an amount and the wallet transfer has an amount. Well, I, Alice starts with a hundred, but she's only sending 10. Understood. But the, but the purse you created has only 10 in it, right? What purse? Via it, the, the transfer method is going to return a purse. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, so transfer is going to build a purse on got this it. name that's called Starvia. Right. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, I missed that. How could you? <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. Um, it's very easy to miss. All right. So then um, we see how it went. And if it went well, we get the payment purse via the via channel. Um, and earlier we got the payee wallet um, and we trace those and then we call the deposit method on the payee with the payment purse. Um, and we look for the deposit result. Um, 
and we trace that, and then we register the payee wallet in the registry. That's the RIs, the insert arbitrary up at the top. Um, isn't it? Yeah, R I is insert arbitrary. That's a code, that's a convention that I saw in other places. Boy, is it not friendly at this point. Um, and then we return that the wallet URI. And then this is the make pay wallet thing. And it uh, the, the one of the things in the system, blah, 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 is a thing to make empty rev purses. So you make an empty rev purse and you call basic wallet and Bob's your uncle. So that's Bob's, what Bob's my uncle with 10 rev. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's what this is doing. Um, and so the sort of proxying stuff normally just has one return channel, but I needed an extra one that's not it's not like a row core object. It's not a string or an integer or anything like that. So that's what this send via thing is for. Um, and it's basically, I made this pre-declare thing. Uh, so it kind of, uh, let's see, in the compilation output, um, yeah. So that's where you get this. Um, so now so this, is got, where, this is where I'm expecting Joshi to ask a question that's going to unlock where I got confused. Yeah, I, I was I was <laughs> not a hundred percent sure. I, I don't know what question to ask. I, I'm not <laughs> I see you're making the variable called Bob Wallet URI. That's pretty well self documented. And this is gonna send via is some asynchronous thing that goes and talks to the node and presumably comes back with a URI. So like maybe a good question is how does send via know what to return? Like, how does it get to be a URI and which URI? And okay. Um, so the normal sort of proxy convention is that you give it a URI into something in the registry, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And so that convention is, is, is respected by this module loader thingy. So when we loaded this module, we exported, there it is right at the top. We exported the send doodad. Okay. Okay. Uh, yep. So now we've got our send URI, which is a registry URI for this contract right here. Right. And so um, the proxy stuff has got two things. One is it's, you can do a make proxy where all this stuff is magically done for you. But underneath make proxy is this send call thing. All right. And in that case, you give it the target and the arguments, and then you can give it a method name. But in, if, in case it's a method, there's no method, then it just doesn't do a method. Um, and, you know, all this stuff. And normally it just packages up whatever arguments you send, it sends them here, makes its own return channel and calls it and gives you back the results, okay? But we needed this extra channel here. So that's what this pre-declare thing is for. So send via wants one more channel and a timestamp and some arguments, and then it will use that as the target, target and do this whole send call to do that. I don't know if I'm making any sense. I think the big idea is make proxy is hiding all of the rolling calls that we would have to run in line to do any of this stuff. But generally speaking, it's always just request response. It's like, well, do this one thing and give me the response back. And there's occasions, the more sophisticated we get, where you got to do more than just request response. You got to do a couple extra things. And well, transferring purses is one of those examples. No, th this is still just request response. The, the, the wrinkle here is normally what you can send over the wire are just kind of JavaScript JSON things like strings and integers and lists and stuff. Okay. But in this case, our argument is not a string or an integer or a list or anything like that. 
this via doodad is an unforgeable name. And we don't have a ROCOR way of, you know, we don't have a, so this has to be like special magic to do that. But you, earlier I saw somewhere where you had something like gprivate.create. Like, didn't you add those to Rocor? I did, and why didn't that work? That's a good question. Okay, that, that's oh, a good question. Well, it's because the... Um, the proxy stuff has to has to do this. It has to new the thing. If I just pass a, an unforgeable name around in the middle of this stuff, it's not declared anywhere, and there's no way to do anything with it. You can't write down an unforgeable name in Rolang, right? Yeah, correct. You can make you can make new ones, and only by doing some of these weird techniques know what they're going to end up being. Yeah, the G private thing was actually a, a sort of a cheat in order to go from a JavaScript object into a protobuf kind of world. So it was for serializing. It was for, you know, getting the bytes to sign. But it doesn't allow you to, you know, make an expression that is that, that it is that name. I sort of worked on, on ways to make it so sort of a, there was a side dictionary that would allow you to look them up and it was kind of a mess. So this is the least messy way that I've found so far. But yeah, it's hard enough to explain that maybe this isn't the way to go. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's okay. You, you did a, a lot of work here and we're just all 45 minutes into sure. it or whatever, right? So I think we're, we're still with you on, on the high and medium level. So I'm ready to move. To right. the um, just, just one more thing though, is the send process two steps. It's the um, create a purse out of Alice's wallet and then wrap that purse in a wallet that Bob owns. Is it two steps? Well, there's all kinds of stuff going on inside the Rolang world, but as far as the JavaScript caller, he just calls this thing and gets the thing back. Even from the Rolang side though, is it those two steps? Like Alice makes a purse out of her wallet and then she wraps it in a wallet. She wraps that purse in a new wallet that Bob owns. Yeah, you transfer out of your own wallet and then you take that purse and stick it in and deposit it in Bob's. And that's what VIA is. VIA is the purse channel. Yeah. All right. I don't actually, I don't actually know Chris number two. I've, or I don't know if I should know him, but. Yeah, Chris, uh, Chris Williams is, he was working side by side with me when we were under marketing. Now he also like me as a free agent. Got it. He, he did a lot of the Archain API stuff with me and Dan. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, he's been back. He's back. We're all back now. Hey guys. All righty. Uh, when we left our hero, we were right here in the middle of this Roland code, taking one purse out of. Hey, since we got dis dis disrupted here, um, uh, I'll. Uh, can you mind if I ask a question that? Not at all. The rest of you, you probably will find uh, old old school, but the um, if down in the your the lower window of your Emacs terminal, you've got just the it's cutting off the send or something where um, I see like at nonce um, and int and what, can you just walk me through what is that syntax doing exactly? The at int part, oh shoot, now it's disappeared. Um, oh, this part here. Yeah, 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 the at okay, URI, right. or the and, sorry, the and, the, what, can you just really quickly walk me through what is that syntax doing? Okay, so, um, this would give me a name, and I usually want to use it as a process, so that I do that. Have you done that before? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. So, um, and then this is a pattern that only matches if the thing is, an, is a URI. So, is that Rolang doing that? But what, how does that translate in Rolang? Like, what's URI in Rolang? If that if, am I, is my question making sense? URI is a base type, just like string or int or bool. There's one of the. It's got back ticks. It's the things with the back ticks. It okay. So so is that um, the protobuf 
what what's what's mapping URI into those back tick strings? Is that the protobuf um, file doing that magic? Well, I mean, th it's kind of like typecasting, right? It's just like an integer or a string, like he said. I mean, there are ints and strings and stuff. And yes, it occurs in the protobuf just because everything in real line occurs in the protobuf. So URI actually occurs in the Rolang then? Yeah, like I said, this is the syntax for it with the back ticks. URI is a first class type. It's, it's equivalent to int in Rolang. It's one of the base types. So the notation is kind of like typecasting? You're just saying expect this type? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's pattern matching, but it, it doesn't cast, yeah, it doesn't change anything. It just says this contract won't fire if you don't put a URI here. Right. So, so the, he's, he's used the and connective there. So the pattern has to match both wallet URI, which definitely that's going to match because that matches anything. And also it has to match the pattern on the right, which is any URI is going to match. So God. by doing it okay. this way, and make sure it's a URI, that's the right half. And we also bind a name to it, that's the left half. That, okay, thank you. That unlocks a lot of understanding that I don't think I knew up until this point. Yeah, that was yeah, cool. And so it's the exact same trick when he does amount and int. It's just a type that's- Yeah, 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 I, I, okay. So, and so is, what are the, like, is there somewhere where these lists of base types are documented? <laughs> well, if I know, I mean, I'm supposed to, I'm sort of supposed to be writing that. I mean, th there's, this is one version now, how you spell URI. I don't, I, I must have looked in the Scala code or something to figure that out. So like legitimately, there's nowhere I could go to figure out what are the uh -huh. total list of base types. I, I think I put it in my tutorial. I'll, I'll dig that up in okay. concurrently. It's, it's, this is one of those developer curiosity things I have that, um, like a, just in understanding the system, I'd like to know like what are the base types that I can you know put in this here in this thing. Sorry to digress on that. No, not that's at all. That's that's it. definitely relevant. Rolling cheat sheet, I think. Is it in the rolling cheat sheet? Oh. Um, Bool if not, or I byte array. Well, it's big. Wait, is it in here? Because it should be if it's not. Yeah, I totally agree, actually. I, now that I say that out loud, I've been using the cheat sheet a lot. Now, it's spelled big U, little r, little i there. And I don't know if that makes a difference. Where did you see it on the cheat sheet, Dan? I don't even see it. Oh, I can't see your mouse. I don't know how, to ex how you'll explain where it is. What color is it in? What color is the box? <laughs> Patterns is in the lower left. OK. Oh yeah, they're that yeah, they're that first bullet. Oh yeah, I wonder how you do spell it. Huh. Oh wow, so byte array is a pattern. It's a type, just like or in type. Three. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really good to know. I wish I'd. Okay, this is awesome. Okay, cool. Thanks for answering that question. Sure, definitely. Uh, I keep vacillating between this is really awesome and this is so complicated nobody's ever going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's like, this is great brain candy. Oh, that's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it was like Chris said, oh, this is fantastic. And I said, well, it's fantastic in a certain twisted kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we get the 10 rev out of one person stick in the other. And registered the URI of, of the wallet that we stuck it into. And okay, now that we have Bob's wallet URI, we can make a proxy for it and we can get it balance. Um, here's the URI of the wallet for Bob and we can get his balance and then get Alice's balance and then the story's over. Nice. You had to do quite a bit to uh, get the 0 0.8 features in place so that you could run this code. Uh, it sounded like, you know, it's pending though, or it's um, any day now. They're going to merge those changes in. 
So no, but it's merged. So if you run the dev branch, you'll get them. Okay. You have to build. Does that? Does the dev branch also have the change to the protobuf where the uh, flow is back to an int and not a, a compound structure? Yes. Okay. So Dan, if I wanted to um, like clone this it, or um, pull it or whatever and, and kind of play around with it and make sure I get it and make little tweaks and everything, what branch, oh, maybe that's what you're showing us right now. Uh, what, what, what's the, oh, payment is the right branch, I guess, right? Yep. Okay, cool. And then in the heart of this, or like the, the place to start studying is this file you're showing, which is testpay.js. Right. This is the story, and then I can dive in on the different row length files and everything else from here. Right. There, there's like the loading thing is, is a separate JavaScript file. And the proxy, the, the loading thing is only in the test directory, but the proxy stuff is in the actual source directory. I've sort of exported that as part of the API, but it's a little bit half baked. Oh, but this loading stuff has a lot to do with your row PM thing. Yeah, I wondered, I wondered about that, how much, how similar our approaches were. What, what file are you showing us now, loading.js? This is yeah. part of uh, our chain API? Well, it's only in the test world right now. Okay. And then, so it basically, t you, you, you give it the Rolang source and, you know, enough stuff to, to do a deploy and it sticks your source here and then uh, puts a little stuff in it. Well, it, it declares exports and trace, sticks your stuff here and then whatever you send to exports, it registers. Oh yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is really similar. We, we, we sort of took similar approaches here. So somewhere I remember when I was looking over the PRs you made somewhere, there was a, a comment about you had sim linked some row lang files. What just, can you just tell us more about that? Cause maybe it'll uncover an interesting corner that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, not very. Uh, let's see. Um, that was in the proxy thing, and you made a comment. Um, do we have to register ourselves? Aren't they in the Genesis block? And I discovered that later. And oh, gotcha. Okay. In this change, no need to deploy the, the Genesis contracts. Oh, cool. Oh, I didn't even see that one come in yet. Okay. Got rid of all that. Yeah, well, six hours. Mm -hmm. Hot off the presses. Okay, cool, cool. So I feel like my understanding level now is that I definitely understand the problem you're solving and the big picture pieces and um, like the, the design of the solution. And I, it would still take me some studying to like reproduce it in a way that isn't just cloning your code and calling it. But that's probably a pretty good point to be at right now, I think. Yeah, and I think it's really good that you tend to actually review things critically because I'd say this is about maybe 80% I'm happy with it. And then other other stuff, it's like, oh, you know, that pre-declare thing was kind of a kludge and, you know, yeah. So the, the big feature that would prevent you know, some subset of this from working in 072 is that we can't pre-compute unforgeable names in 072. They added that to 08, and so that is, the only way this is gonna work is if we have that feature. Yeah, or if you learn how to do it, if you somehow, in theory, it's, it's, a, it's a computation that you, it's just a bunch of integers and strings and stuff like that. You can compute it on the client side. I just never figured it out, so I just cheated and said, oh, you figure it out. No, no, it's, it's the proper time. They sorted it for us. Well, so it's, maybe me. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yes. You sorted it for us, yes. Uh, so we're there. Yeah. Man, 0.8 can't hit quick enough. Yeah, the irony is, well, I mean, the irony is that it was all kinds of work to figure out how to get the test to work, and then the actual code was like 10 lines. <laughs> Oi.
So Dan, do you want to give us a, um, an update on what Rocore looks like? I know it supports yeah. maps now and maybe some other stuff. Um, yeah, let me just fly by this thing. Wow, they've been doing a lot of stuff. Oh, there's a robot that came in and did a bunch of PRs. So that's the code I added, right? And then all this is tests. Uh, oh, then I, I changed a few lines at Protobuf as well. Anyway, um, yeah, so if you want more of these things, it's pretty cookie cutter to make them. I don't really understand what all this is doing, except I just, I can copy and paste with the best of them, right? <laughs> Yeah, you copy paste Scala a lot better than I can, though. <laughs> um, what what is the feasibility of the feature that that Chris was asking about, where I like just do some exploratory runs of of Rolang either against my own node or, I mean, I think the 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 it seems like the tricky part there is reverting the tuple space back to whatever it was. Well, I've seen code that does checkpoint and and going back. Um, uh, I can imagine getting it done in a few hours. Um, it doesn't look like a whole lot of fun, so it would you know, if somebody wanted to do it with me or something, that would. That's the way I usually get things that are not fun. Yeah, I mean, I. You, you know our relationship in Scala coding. I would love to learn and provide moral support and maybe throw out a good idea here or there, but mostly it would be watching and learning for, for Scala stuff. But I, I'm down for that, definitely. Yeah, because that could be a pretty big deal. Because, I mean, Joe has made the point that there, I mean, there's a lot of people have said, well, I want to know what it's going to cost to run my contract, right? Yeah, right. Well, as well as not paying at all if, if you're in a certain position. Um, and the only way to do that is to run the thing, right? It's the halting problem, literally, yeah. right? Yeah, totally. Um, so what you need is a is a read-only node. It can't be completely read-only because it actually does have to, you know, write to the tuple store because otherwise the contract won't execute correctly, right? At the yeah, it's my understanding is is you it's not read only at all it's just you're checkpointing the tuple space running your code and then reverting the tuple space yep yeah. that's that would be the way that i would implement that or and i think i talked that through with michael birch and he said yeah that that's the way it would something like that would work and he wrote a little piece of code where so he could do that at the scala at this svt prompt i believe so yeah yeah so i've seen it so I, yeah i could scare that up if, if we needed to but we should get back to maybe we should get back to Rocor or we could keep going down this route. I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm probably not up for diving into the code right now, although maybe you guys could get me there. But yeah, like Rocor sounds really good. I would I'd like to keep on top of how that works. Yeah, so what did I do there? Um so Rocor is um how the JavaScript code can understand the rolling right yeah rolling data sort of okay it, it's it's a little bit easier than dealing with the the um uh grpc api stuff it's supposed to hide that a little bit um, um okay so that statement doesn't totally make sense to me okay well if you want to like, well, let's see. Um, okay, so this from JS data thing here. If I didn't have that, I'd have to write experts. Uh, no, experts is a list. 
key int not comma g int colon scenario. You see what I'm doing? Yeah. The, okay. So that's the that's the gRPC um, data struct format for in right. Java, represented in Java, and as a as JSON, right? Um. So. So we just have this two or no? Um, so there was a oh, weird. It comes from that that paper, mobile process calculator for whatever the heck. Anyway, um, all it does is take data that's like any JavaScript programmer would make, and it says, okay, how do I turn that into row lang data? If it's a URL, I added the URL pretty recently, but if and at least those are the ones I and if it's these three are the ones I added recently. But if um, if it's a Boolean, then do that. If it's an integer, do that. If it's a string, do that. If it's an object or an array, there's a little bit of work. But I hope it's straightforward, you know. But it, and it can go the other way, and it can go from the the uh, the, the protobuf stuff to Rolang syntax. So so if I have like a a list of integers in um in javascript that integers are really pars and pars have experts and all that they're like kind of deeply nested like highly structured things in the proto buff world and so like rocore is just taking care of that like stuff for me right yep yeah okay exactly oh and the other thing that's a little bit cool um um, so if you have, if you want to write Rolang with stuff interpolated into it, you can write roll uh, new x in ABC bang uh, JavaScript stuff. No. Well, that's not a exa good example, but if I just, ha if I have, you know, some variable, it's like, And then this will take my stuff as a list, it'll spell it out and it'll do all the string coding and all that kind of garbage that you just, you know, it's a pain in the ass. So that's basically going to, it's going to apply like from JS data to whatever's in the curly braces, in this case, my stuff, and then drop it right into the proper spot in your, oh yeah, I see. Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm so used to doc test that it's really a pain for me to have the test separate from the documentation. I was like, ah, do you use doc test anybody else? I, I've used it a little bit in Python, not too much though. It's, oh, let's see. Actually, the best, you know, these are the best documentation down here. So if you write roll lookup URI return, then it's going to spell it out this way. Oh, and Chris, you added URL support to a certain extent, but I kind of commented back that I always meant, meant to make sure that to JS data and from JS data are, you know, are duals of each other. So I didn't want to just go back to a string. So it goes back to a, a JavaScript URL do that. Nice. Um, so right, all the changes to row core are, this might be the best documentation for them. So then the, the stretch goal or, you know, something down the road was, um, you know, Alice has to pass a URI for a wallet out of band over to Bob and say, here's where I put your wallet. And we were discussing, is there a way that this all just happens and Bob, you know, just he has a new wallet. He has a wallet with increased coins in it. Uh, on chain, there's no out of band notifications or anything like that. And that started the whole conversation about DID. Yeah, well, there's always some out of band conversation, uh, com communication. I mean, if I want to send you 10, 10 ether, you got to tell me your public, key, right? Right. Yeah. So that I, 
nobody can ever solve that, right? Well, I, uh, technically, so if it's ETH, somebody's sending you an, your ETH address. Correct. It's not technically a public key. That's true. Um, and so the question is in our, on our chain, what is it? Is it in our chain, it, it could be a myriad of things. And are we going to standardize on one thing or are there going to be multiple things forever? I think it's a feature, not a bug that there's multiple things. It, it allows us, I mean, everybody's so excited about key compatibility with Ethereum, but the fact that it can be multiple things also allows us key compatibility with Bitcoin or like, you know, if we had other SIG algorithms at one point. So it, I kind of think that's a feature. I, I, I was interested though, you know, like, yeah, there definitely has to be at least one out of band conversation, but, um, it would be nice if like once I knew someone's public key or address or, you know, any one of those pieces of information, like then I could send them tokens multiple times in the future or, and not have to tell them where I sent the tokens every time or I'm interested. In yeah. So there's that. some richness that, that starts to look attractive, but the, the thing that's, that I'm kind of down about is here's, here's the, the state of the art. These are the expectations, right? When you create either a Bitcoin or Ethereum thing, you just generate a random number, right? You don't need to tell anybody else about it. You don't have to synchronize it with the blockchain. You don't have to run a client. You could use dice, right? Yeah. Yep. Totally agree. Um, and well, sort of. You have to give them the. You have to give them something, though. You yeah, manipulate your random number to give them something. Yeah. But to create it in the first place, you don't talk to. You don't do any on-chain communication, right? Right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Correct. Right. I can yes. just roll a bunch of dice, put it on a business card, hand it to you, and we're done. Yes. Right. Okay. So I could not come up with that scenario here for Alice to pay Bob. Well, so that's, I don't know if you looked at Michael Birch's, um, I think it's called uh, the ETH. Um, uh, they solved this to deal with uh bootstrapping all the rock holders well sort of yeah there's a there's a there's a thing called a wallet check in at genesis everybody's all the people that have rock are going to have one um it it seems to me like that whatever we do there should be generalized like the, the fact that it's a one-off seems wrong to me like it should just be generalized so a downside is that the list of these things has to be stored. What do you mean? Well, so well, stored. You mean stored on chain? Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's a huge bug where I can just go along and, and do a wallet check at your address and boop, there went your rev. I filed that bug. Well, yeah, I saw you filed something. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, okay, Genesis happens in these claim contract stores full of stuff, right? Claim contract store, they start by sending... What it's, full of, it's a map from, map. It's a map from Ethernet addresses to, to rights for, for, for rev. Okay. okay. Yep, understood. All right. All right. I go I, along, and, I, and this thing is published in the registry, so I go look it up, and I call this contract with your Ethernet address and a bogus purse or whatever. Boop, there went your Ethernet. You oh, sure? you didn't steal them, but they're destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is it a, is it a, is it a last right wins? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's funny. That is a big bug. <laughs> but so, so if there were just a smart contract though, that, that where the destination payee was a public key and it was smart enough to accumulate the persons that are sent to it, this would solve, it would solve what we're looking for, right? And then the claimer would still have to have the private key to claim. Yeah, you can make a, like a public rev rendezvous point, rendezvous point or whatever, but like it still has to have this big map. And reading and writing that map is gonna cost, right? Yeah, and so the way that you solved it and what you just showed us, Dan, is not fundamentally different here. Instead of using a map like what you've got highlighted, you just use the registry. Correct. My expectation is that the registry is going to be somewhat, it's going to be somewhat to, to try. I guess we could even try instead of the stupid thing. 
So Chris, I, I see what you're saying about like there's code here that will verify that the public key trying to claim the thing is, you know, for the corresponding ETH address. And I agree that that's useful and should be generalized. And I'd even, you know, be happy to take a crack at it. But I doesn't, I don't think what we have here solves the problem of Alice creates an intermediate thing for Bob and then gives it to him, or Bob creates something and says to Alice, put the funds here. Like it, one of them has to do that, I think, right? Yeah, yeah totally. I, I was uh, maybe suggesting, especially because Chris is on the call with us, that this is maybe totally a life ID play. You know, we need uh, the, the intermediary and, you know, uh, is that the proper fit? We've got these okay. DIDs and all that sort of thing. So that, that is, you know, one possibility, you know, to, to Josh's point, you know, what, you know, you could argue it's a feature that it could be many things. And one of the things could be a did a DID. And that like that for me is that's kind of been my viewpoint up till now um, is that is that DID should be able to accept payments. Um, but it doesn't but we still have to put some thought around if you haven't created it, created it yet on chain, right? How will it work? And that's, that's a legitimate question that I, that I would need to put some uh, mental power against. Um, because I think maybe that's okay. That, that, that that's just not a thing. So for, for me, like if I wake up in the morning and I, I can't just go to the world and say, how much money do I have? I have to go and, and keep track of all my accounts. Right. Yeah, I like I read that when you wrote it, and I like that analogy. Because I mean, in, in Ethereum and black in in Bitcoin, there's this expectation that that uh, um, that there are uh, block explorers, and you yeah. you put your public key in there or your ETH address, and it tells you how much money you have. Right. Um, uh, the, my only my only comeback to that would be, and, and this is a question of how you know what kind of people do we want to track? If if you're trying to if you're trying to make things make sense for people that are Ethereum and Bitcoin yeah. users, it's, it's a stumbling block. Yeah. Right. On the other hand, it, how many people went, wait a minute, the whole world can see my bank balance. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole different conversation. Like, cause there, there's the whole, I mean, not to, not to make this even more complicated than it needs to be, but uh, you throw in Zcash style payments and then, um, it's, which I think at one point someday our chain should, should support. Like I do think it's legitimate for people to not want to sure. allow yeah, the whole world to see their balance. Yeah. Um, but I, I was uh, not anticipating solving that problem in Mercury, the, the well, zero knowledge stuff. Right. There's the really hard problem of actual zero knowledge and stuff, but there's also this, just the, you know, Oh, um, Making it a computational task to, to grab the data, although in theory you could grab it. Right. Yeah. I mean, so here's, here's one thing I think is true. At the end of the day, if Alice is paying Bob, Bob has to tell Alice where to send the payment. I don't yeah. think it makes sense for Alice to create something and say, here you go, Bob. Like, I don't know how that could ever work. Well, this the scenario that I've got right now has got both downsides. Bob has to tell Alice the public key, and Alice has to send him something. But it could be kind of reasonable to say, well, there are hitching posts. You yeah. Know? <laughs> well, and so uh, what, what I had been contemplating in my head, which I'll, I'll fully admit may has not been fully thought out, is that is that the in the did world you could send to a did and in that world if people sent to the did and it wasn't yet created on chain things would still work so that when you created it you would basically slurp up all transfers sent to that did at that point if that makes sense yeah like to me that's what i would expect yeah that makes perfect sense that's i think that's a totally relangable thing to do right this is the send coming before the contract that it's calling exactly that seems that seems like a good idea to me. I just don't know how what it looks like exactly in Rolang. Because at the end of the day, that at least for me, did creation is a registry entry step. So, yeah. so, so if somebody's sending to it and it's not created yet, is that like 
the uh-huh. beauty of Ethereum is there's no there's no magic. It just works, right? <laughs> Ethereum all Ethereum addresses are valid addresses, whether they're on chain or not. Yeah. And and so um yeah, any rate. Yeah, so I I actually maybe this is a problem with the registry or let, let me just think out loud for a second here. In in Rolang, if if we are going to use a public name or if somehow we have a private name with with shared scope and um and the deal is i'm going to make a send on that name and then and then chris is going to have a build a contract on that name it doesn't matter what order we do that in and if i get antsy and send before he's bothered to build the contract whenever he gets around to it everything still works happily and it would be really cool if the registry worked that way but it it doesn't work that way because when i go to do a registry lookup at a given name if there's nothing registered there yet it would be really cool if that registry lookup just stayed in the tuple space and then maybe came back someday whenever something's registered there but instead what i get back is is nil and and then you know my my call oh for my fails or errors so, out or whatever but so we, could put so, we could put something in the registry that that does what you want you mean by like changing the implementation? No, not not changing the registry. We'll just stick something. We'll register something that does what you want. So everybody has to to look this thing up, but it's going to win. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. You know, it's a hitching post thing. Please send this to the thing to the guy with this public key. Hold on to it until he comes to claim it. Yeah. So Dan, that's that's been the the like. My brain is sort of fast tracked. I think that's where I'm going to end up. But Josh, you just said something that kind of unlocked a, another thought, which was, um, and it gets actually back to our original, our initial implementation of our DID registry um, worked by using DIDs as um, compound names. And, and what, was, what was problematic about it was that you couldn't do a lookup to find names that don't exist yet because the lookup doesn't return until the name exists. And so um, if there were some way to do a peek to see if the name existed, the, the registry, or the, sorry, the rolling term without having to like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting uh, a little uh, uh, scatterbrained here, but so step, stepping back a little bit. Originally, when we created our did registry, we created them using an unforgeable name that it was the contract and then the did string. So basically those two together formed the, the Rolang term or name. I don't know if I'm using the right uh, vocabulary. But the problem was when we did a lookup, if nobody had registered a did yet, you would, you would never return as opposed to returning nil, which is what the registry does. But if the registry, if it worked that way, um, and the registry never returned until it re- ex- until it existed, then you could send and receive exactly as Josh had just said. The hitching post is basically rolling. The challenge is we still need a way to do a lookup to see if it, in those cases that it doesn't exist, because that's a that's a like our like our web-based interface we're going to do a lookup and we want to know if it's not there and the, on chain we need a way to do that does that make sense i'm testing to see whether it makes sense <laughs> <Are you> using, <laughs> um so did that, did that sort of long-winded explanation uh i definitely followed the distinction between the two kinds of registries and the the trade-offs between them that made sense to me. Okay, the the latter one gets gets what you just said, which is you do a registry lookup and it doesn't it doesn't actually give you an answer until somebody registers a name there. Yeah, right. That I mean, depending on your perspective, that's either a feature <laughs> exactly. or a bug, right? But I don't think there's one size exactly. fits all. No, it, precisely. But if you if you can do a peak, quote unquote, then then you get then you, the 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 hitch post is in uh, uh, Dan's term would work just through rolling itself. You don't, we don't need special. What's the, what's the peak, Chris? Is it like a, it is like, registered? Like, or like, like def- you know, 
checking does, whether yeah, it's registered this, there. If I did a if I did a receive on this, would it re, would would I get something? I'm pretty sure you can't do that from within rolling. Right. I, I'm pretty sure you can't. And, and no, I actually know you can't. And in fact, uh, one of my conversations in Discord with Kent uh, unlocked because I had assumed, actually, I'd, I'd asked a question about a language feature that was supposed to come in the future, but it's not here yet. And I, because I kind of made an assumption that maybe it would get us this, but it doesn't. I think it might actually be peak or something like that. At any rate, um, so this, I, this is just more food for thought on how to do this. I, th I think in today's world, um, we need to have some contract that's doing the, the magic. Like you send it somewhere and if it doesn't exist, then some contract picks it up and then fulfills it later. Uh, so I, I'm not sure at some point you guys agreed that there's no way to do this in Rolang itself. I'm, I'm not sure that's true. If the hitching post is a, is a Rolang map, um, like it looked like it was in, in the ch wallet check or whatever they called that, there's a, um, th there's a method called like get, get or else or something. So it's either going to get the thing at that key in the map, or it's going to give you this default value. And so then you test for the maybe the default value, some unforgeable name or whatever. And if you get the default back, you know that. Yeah, I was just hoping to not use a map. I was hoping to just use the tuple store. Yeah. Okay. okay so that that's a good point, Joshy. I and I had, I had steered away from using a map as well, primarily just thinking of scale. But that. Yeah, you're you're talking about not having to synchronize all the accesses to the map. Well, um, if you look at the registry itself, it's not a map. It's a um, try. Yeah. yeah. And I and I believe it's that way for scale. Yeah, and we can you can we can build another try, and that'll be you know, then you have you, you won't have to read and write as much data. Ooh, how do you write? Yeah. So what, uh, this might be a silly question, but what makes the map, I mean, the map is, is a hash map under the table, right? So what makes it not scale? Well, it, it's, it's an immutable thing, right? The, when you do a set on the map, it doesn't like change the map. It gives you a new map that's got one more thing in it. Right. Everybody has to get in line. <laughs>